Welcome to Teaching 9-11 and the Constitution, Free Speech and Civil Liberties. We are joined today by David Hudson, Assistant Professor of Law at Belmont University. Jennifer Legassi, Assistant Director of Education Programs at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. And Maria Gallo, Director of Professional Development and Special Programs at the Center for Civic Education. My name is Mark Gage. And now for a few housekeeping details. This webinar is scheduled for about an hour and a half and it is being recorded. We will hear first from Jennifer Legassi of the 9-11 Memorial Museum, followed by David Hudson of Belmont University. We'll then have a 10 minute Q&A session followed by Maria Gallo of the Center for Civic Education. Please go ahead and put all your questions in the Q&A or in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. None of us will ever forget where we were 20 years ago on September 11th, 20, uh, 2001. It quickly, quickly became a cliche to say that on that day, the world changed forever, but it is nevertheless true. The United States reacted quickly to the terrorist attacks, launching Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan on October 7, 2001, and enacting the Patriot Act into law on October 26. 20 years later, we've pulled out of Afghanistan, but the legacy of 9-11 remains and has important implications for all of us. How do we as educators teach 9-11 to a generation with no memory of the attacks? And how did the government's response to those attacks affect free speech and civil liberties? And was this response effective? These are the topics of tonight's discussion. When discussing the government's response to 9-11, I am always reminded of Benjamin Franklin's quote, those who give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Is this true? And what is the proper balance between liberty and safety? Now, before we begin, we'll hear from Mia Nagawicki, the Center for Civic Education's Vice President and Chief of Staff. I'll turn it over to you, Mia. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, everybody. I am Mia Nagawicki, Vice President and Chief of Staff at the Center for Civic Education. And on behalf of Christopher Riano, our President, and the entire Center team, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this evening's webinar. Uh, I know many of you are already very familiar with the Center for Civic Education and our work, but I am new to the Center and we have some other new friends joining us this evening. So I will start with just a brief introduction. Uh, the Center for Civic Education is a national civics education organization and we were founded in 1965, which makes us one of the oldest civics education organizations in the country. Uh, our programs have a presence in all 50 states and in nations around the world, and they explore constitutional history, principles, and institutions to provide learners with the practical knowledge and the skills that they need to be responsible members of their communities. Through our learning experiences, we come to understand and appreciate that our system of government is not static and that constitutional democracy in the United States was designed to accommodate an ever-changing world uh, and that we all have a role to play in shaping our present and future. Uh, and for me, tonight's topic, commemorating the 20th anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks, uh, speaks to this particularly directly and uh, somewhat viscerally. So as we commemorate that 20th anniversary, uh, we honor those who were tragically lost in the attacks and those who have served in the 20 years since. We're also prompted to reflect upon September 11, 2001 as a turning point in our nation's history and consider how much the world, our country, and our lives have changed. For some of us, 9-11 was a monumental and monumentally hard day in our adult lives. Others of us, like me, were children or young adults when the attacks happened, which means our coming of age and our political awakening happened in the post 9-11 world uh, and in the context of 9-11's transition from immediate memory to legacy. And as Mark said, for students in our classrooms today, it's just distant history. So I'm looking forward to learning together with all of you tonight how we can approach this challenging topic in our classrooms and through a constitutional lens to also uh, commemorate Constitution Day. So I want to thank Professor David Hudson for sharing his expertise with us tonight. 
Thanks very much to all of you for joining us. Uh, and finally, a very big thank you to Jen Lagasse, Assistant Director of Education Programs from the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, uh, and an old friend of mine. We go back to our days at the New York Historical Society uh, a number of years ago, in Jen's case, and more recently in my case. But Jen, I'm delighted to see you again in this context. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your wisdom with us tonight, and I will let you take it away from here. Thanks so much, Mia. And I want to thank the entire staff of the Center for Civic Education for allowing me to be a part of this really wonderful program and to share some resources with you that hopefully will help you and support you as you both commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks and investigate its enduring impacts with your students. So I'm going to take a moment to share my screen with you. Just give me one second to do that. All right, so as we are approaching this 20th anniversary, as, our, as my other panelists have already mentioned, educators, many of them find themselves in this very resonant gap, needing to bridge what is a visceral and emotional experience often for those of us with a lived memory, reaching towards our students who were born after the event, who have all of the distance that comes with history, even though this event was only 20 years ago. So in our work at the museum, one of the most powerful tools that we have found for bridging this gap is to ground the historical narrative in the first person voice. So this approach forms the foundation of our largest virtual program, and it is also our farthest reaching resource. And it's, a, it's something called Anniversary in the Schools. So this resource, and it's completely free and it's now in its sixth year, has two components. So the first component is an on-demand film pre-recorded that you can stream at any time starting tomorrow, September 10th and going forward through September. And it features six 9-11 stakeholders standing near artifacts in the museum that connect to their story, and they are telling it in a way that's really appropriate for students. So along with this on-demand film, um, the reason I'm going to be very excited but very sleep deprived for the next few days is that we also run an interactive live chat. So at the same time that you're watching this film with your students, on the 10th and 11th, I and 16 of my colleagues will be at our computers all day long, live chatting with students participating in the programs, answering the difficult questions to take pressure off of educators to have to do so. Um, you can see this is an example of a chat that I had with a school last year. Um, so the program, as I said, it is actually becoming available in the very wee hours of the morning tomorrow, September 10th. And it will be available with closed captions, with ASL interpretation, with verbal description, and with Spanish subtitles. So uh, all you have to do to register for this free opportunity and participate is go to 911memorial.org slash webinar. Now, this year's theme is twofold. There's the importance of commemorating the 20th anniversary for a generation with no memory, of course. And also there's this additional layer of how what we learned in the aftermath of 9-11 can help us navigate the challenges we face today as our students and ourselves navigate a global pandemic. So with that in mind, when we picked speakers this year and we started brainstorming, we wanted to blend the stories from first responders, survivors, and witnesses directly with voices from the next generation. So this year's featured speakers are, in the order that they appear, Carlton Shelley II, who is a West Point graduate, who was a student at the elementary school where George W. Bush was notified of the 9-11 attacks. Bill Spade, a retired FDNY member of Rescue 5 on Staten Island, and his son, John Spade, who was two months old on September 11th and is a graduate of our student ambassador program. And he's now currently a 9-11 museum docent alongside his father. Will Jimeno, a retired Port Authority police officer who was buried in the rubble for several hours, survived and was successfully rescued on 9-11. And then two young women who are friends named Brielle um, Saracini and Caitlin Levy. 
Um, Brielle's father was the pilot of Flight 175, and Kate Levy's father was a firefighter. These two young women became friends at a camp, um, through camps, and at an organization called Tuesday's Children, which serves nine, children that were affected by 9-11. So uh, as educators, you know it's always more powerful to show than to tell. So rather than tell you any more about the program, I'm going to show you a very short trailer so that you can meet these six extraordinary individuals in their own words. So allow me to pull that up to share with you right now. Of course, it doesn't want to recognize. Give me, sorry, of course, everything. There's always small, technical difficulties. Sorry. Well, sorry about that, Jennifer. Of course, that always happens right when we're- That's all right. Yeah, and of course, life. of course, in the run up to this, when we tested everything, it worked out. <laughs> it worked fine. Regardless, even if we can't share the trailer, it is available at 911memorial.org slash webinar. So, you know, rather than try to fight technology, uh, I will admit defeat in this one instance and we can continue. Um, so I will say it is our hope that this slate of speakers really highlights the importance of commemoration and also offers those messages of hope, you know, demonstrating that there is an after and that we can move forward in the face of tragedy, which is a message that is particularly resonant this year. Um, and I, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud because previously the program last year served 340,000 students. As of the last time I checked, we have nearly 1.2 million students registered this year to take part in the program. Um, so I hope that you will join us with that community from around the world. Um, and thank you so much to Mia for sharing the link to that trailer. So in addition, I do have some other resources to share with you. So let me pull those up so that we can see those. Wonderful. All right, so we have um, something called the 9-11 Primer, which is an exhaustive and comprehensive resource. It is made up of six modules. Each module hues to a theme. So you can see module one is the events of 9-11. Module two is the antecedents of 9-11, the history of the World Trade Center, solidarity after 9-11, memorializing 9-11, and particularly relevant given this topic of this program, a module discussing the repercussions of 9-11. So what each module is made up of is an answer to a frequently asked question on the topic theme, primary sources, including speeches, executive orders, legislative acts, debates, and government reports, a suggested reading list organized by age all the way from young childhood to adulthood, and also related resources, including interactive timelines, webinars, speakers from the past, lesson plans, public programs, artifacts from our digital collection, blog posts, and so much more. So the 9-11 Primer can easily serve as a one-stop shop for integrating the story of 9-11 into your classroom. And it supplements the webinar beautifully to go beyond the commemoration of the day and dig into some of the meatier content area related to 9-11. Additionally, we also have a free printable poster exhibition that we created this year in partnership with the American Library Association entitled September 11th, 2001, The Day That Changed the World. And um, this is another resource that you can make use of. So both the primer and the poster show are available on our website. You go to 911memorial.org, hover over the Learn tab, and select Resources, and you can find all of that. So finally, uh, the final resource that I'll talk about are our multimedia lesson plans. They are created for grades three through 12, and they are divided by grades and themes. So here I've zeroed in on the lesson plans that connect to the repercussions of 9-11. So every lesson plan begins with an essential question, learning goals, vocabulary, 
And then it has the activity outlined and any media or images that you need to actually conduct the program are fully embedded within the lesson plan. So the one that I've pulled out here, because it felt particularly relevant, is about balancing national security and civil liberties. And it centers around a New Yorker cover called Holiday Travel, where Santa Claus is clearly going through post 9-11 airport screening for the first time. So again, to find these lesson plans, you also go to 911memorial.org and hover over learn, pick students and teachers, and you will see a link to lesson plans. So before we continue with tonight's program, I really wanna take a moment to thank each of you during what is an incredibly busy and hectic time for all educators right at the beginning of the year to attend this program and to invite you if you have any questions about uh, anything that I've shared or the webinar, please feel free to reach out at school programs at 911memorial.org. And with that, I believe I will pass it back. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, thank you for sharing those wonderful resources for us and your work cannot be more important than at this time. Uh, and we appreciate the, the work that you and your colleagues do. Uh, it's very, very important. And it's amazing. I would you know, highly recommend everybody check out uh, the website 911memorial.org um, there is a lot, there are a lot of things there for teachers, um, like Jen mentioned. So um, go ahead and check it out, everybody. Uh, now I want to introduce uh, our uh, keynote speaker of the evening, uh, Professor David Hudson of Belmont University, who is an expert on uh, First Amendment issues and will bring uh, his scholarly take to uh, the issues surrounding 9-11 um, uh, to the discussion. So David, without further ado, I will turn it over to you. And I'm not hearing you right now, David. I don't, I don't know if you're um, on mute. Can you hear me now, Mark? I can hear you now. Excellent. Okay, thank wonderful. You so and th thank you so much. And thank you to the entire, like Jennifer said, thank you to the entire staff at the Center for Civic Education. The Center for Civic, Civic Education really changed my life. It, it was really through my participation with the We the People program back in 1995 that really took my interest in the Constitution to, to a whole new level to a whole new level. I had just joined the First Amendment Center. And I, I don't think honestly I would be uh, teaching law if it was not for the Center for Civic Education. I don't know if I've ever said that publicly, but I think it's true. You heard it first here, folks. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about 9-11 and specifically the Patriot Act and talk about what Mark said, referencing the Franklin quote about how we do calibrate the balance between liberty and security. But first, I want to go back and look at, at history. I believe it was Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes who once wrote that a page of history is worth a volume of logic. And what we can see historically throughout time is Whenever there is an emergency or a war, there generally is a contraction or retraction of individual liberty. We have to go no further than a mere seven years after the ratification of the Bill of Rights in 1791. Seven years later in 1798, the Federalist controlled Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Act. The Sedition Act of 1798 was probably the most draconian of those four from a First Amendment perspective. The Sedition Act of 1798 essentially criminalized making any false, scandalous, or malicious writing about the government of the United States. And it specifically said you essentially could not defame the President of the United States, uh, members of Congress, et cetera. But as many of you probably know, it conveniently left out the vice president. Well, why was that? 
Well, at that time, the government was controlled by the Federalist. John Adams was a Federalist. Both houses of Congress were dominated by the Federalist. But the Democratic Republicans, led by Thomas Jefferson, vigorously disagreed with the administration's policies. And they disagreed with the hostility that the United States was having with France at that time. And so the Sedition Act of 1798 was essentially used by the Federalists to prosecute Democratic Republicans. They prosecuted mainly Democratic Republican newspaper editors who had the temerity to criticize President Adams and other leaders. One of the leading examples was Matthew Lyon, a man who was beaten over the head by Roger Griswold on the, on the House floor at one time, but he was also the head of a newspaper in Vermont. And he, and he wrote about John Adams having this uh, ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation and selfish avarice. And, and for that, he was prosecuted sent to jail and actually, I believe, earned re-election from, from his jail cell. There were other prosecutions, notable prosecutions under the Sedition Act. Some of the prosecutions were directly under the Sedition Act of 1798. Others were brought under more state common law sedition claims. But Benjamin Bach, he, Bosch, the grandson of Benjamin Franklin, was prosecuted. He was the editor, I believe, of the Philadelphia Aurora. Probably the most interesting one for my students when I talk about the Sedition Act of 1798 was one Luther Baldwin, who really was prosecuted under the Sedition Act for doing nothing more than uh, uttering a drunken rant that was critical of President Adams. It just so happened that in his New Jersey town, President Adams was uh, going down the street and uh, Luther Baldwin made the interesting comment that if, if there goes the president and they're firing at his arse, I do not care if they fire through his arse. Uh, and for that uh, unusual comment, he was actually prosecuted under the Sedition Act of, of 1798. We know that leading Democratic Republican politicians, including Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, vigorously opposed the Sedition Act of 1798, as did Albert Gallatin. And pr probably the most notable response, of course, are the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. So normally when I teach about the Sedition Act of 1798, I'll put on a screen the Sedition Act of 1798 and then I'll have the text of the Kentucky Resolution and a text of the Virginia Resolution and talk about what often happens when you have factions in society, right? And that's what we have in a society that's protected by the First Amendment, where we have such broad and enduring protection, particularly for pure political speech. And that's ultimately what made the Sedition Act of 1798 anathema to the First Amendment. Now we know that the Sedition Act of 1798 uh, expired on its own terms. And when Jefferson defeated Adams in the election of 1800 and became president, he eventually pardoned all those who had been convicted uh, under the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act was never successfully challenged in court, but years later in 1964, in the celebrated US Supreme Court decision of New York Times Company versus Sullivan, Justice William Brennan said, while it was never tested in court, essentially that history had shown that it was patently unconstitutional. This pattern of overreaction to opposition to the government in times of war continued during the United States Civil War. One of the most prominent examples of that was Ohio Congressman Clement Vallandigham, who made some rather intemperate remarks about uh, President Lincoln. He called the war a wicked exercise. He said it was cruel and unnecessary. And for that, 
he essentially was arrested by General Ambrose Burnside, charged under a military con uh, commission and placed in exile. And again, what he said is much less than what some other politicians will say about the, pre the last couple presidents, the opposing political party. And one of the ways that I try to show this to students is I will have a text of Vallandigham's speech, and then I will contrast that with uh, perhaps a, a, a somebody who was very critical of President Donald Trump or a politician who's very critical of, of President Biden. We also know that Lincoln, for example, suspended the writ of habeas corpus, the great freedom. Uh, the United States Supreme Court later ruled that unconstitutional in ex parte Milligan, but that was after the com completion of the war. Arguably, the greatest pattern of overreaction may have taken place around the time of World War I. There was a lot of internal opposition and debate as to whether the United States should maintain an isolationist policy or uh, enter World War I and help our allies. And in order to combat in internal, alleged internal sedition, the United States Congress passed the Espionage Act of 1917 and then an amendment to the Espionage Act of 1917 called the Sedition Act of 1918. And essentially the Espionage Act of 1917 as interpreted and applied, prohibited criticism of the United States war effort, criticism of the draft, et cetera. And it was, there were thousands of prosecutions under the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918. And it's largely because of the thousands of prosecutions under these two federal laws that the United States Supreme Court first began developing First Amendment jurisprudence. The Sedition Act of 1918 is probably more directly an affront to the uh, First Amendment than the Espionage Act because it essentially recreated the old English common law concept of seditious libel. And there were some very egregious prosecutions under this. Uh, I have the heading Eugene Debs, I should say Rose Pastor Stokes, a famous activist back in the day was prosecuted for what would now be considered a rather uh, mundane comment. Perhaps most notably Eugene Debs, uh, a multi-time candidate for the presidency and a famed labor organizer gave a speech in Canton, Ohio in 1918. And he essentially criticized the United States war effort and told the people that, that they're some, fit for something better than slavery and common fodder. That's pure political speech. That's the core type of speech that the First Amendment was designed to protect. Going back to Times v. Sullivan, what did Justice Brennan write in Times v. Sullivan? He said, we must interpret the First Amendment against, quote, a profound national commitment. That debate on public issues must be robust, uninhibited, and wide open, and may well include vehement, sharp, and unpleasantly caustic attacks upon public officials. That's the essence of the First Amendment, is the ability of citizens to directly criticize their government officials. Hey, David? Sorry to interrupt for a second, but um, the, we're not seeing the slides advance, actually. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Sorry. Uh, they were, uh, as, as always, everyone, uh, they worked in practice, but then, you know, I mean, it's the gremlins, I guess. Uh, okay. Can you see them now? or? I can't, no. Oh, okay. It just worked. Boom, there it is. I see in times of war there. emergency. Does it, does it go work in there? Yes, it is working. Ah, okay. Thank you, thank you. So, so sorry. I will make copies of this available to Mark and uh, Mia and Maria 
and anyone that wants those can have them. Um, they also have my contact information. I'll be happy to um, give you any information that I have. Uh, the best source that I know of about the overreactions in the time of World War I is a book by legal historian Paul Murphy called World War I and the Origin of Civil Liberties. And he has an entire list of like gross draconian overreactions. I only selected a few of them here, but these are stunning to me. The Los Angeles Board of Education prohibits any discussion of peace. Um, Pittsburgh authorities prohibit the playing of music by Beethoven. Um, 27 farmers in South Dakota are convicted for exercising the sometimes last forgotten freedom of the First Amendment, the right to petition. I mean, think about it, the Magna Carta of 1215 and the Declaration of Independence of 1776 are petitions. It's absolutely astonishing that, that some of these things happened and uh, Murphy documents those, those pretty well. Now, it was also around this time, as I said, that the United States Supreme Court began developing First Amendment jurisprudence. And the first real pure First Amendment case, there were, there were a few that mentioned it before, but really the starting point for many people was a prosecution under the espionage of 1917. It was the prosecution of Charles Schenck and Elizabeth Baer. Uh, and they were essentially socialist. Baer gets left out. Um, though a lot of the people prosecuted were um, suffragists and uh, I guess what uh, historian Linda Lunsden once referred to as rampant women. That was the title of her book. There was a headline in the New York Times that pejoratively labeled them rampant women. Uh, but if you look at a lot of the early free speech cases, it, it was women who were prosecuted. It was a really disproportionate thing. It doesn't get talked about very much. Anyway, a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, but Schenck and Bear really all they did was distribute leaflets that were critical of the war effort. And they posted a text of the 13th Amendment and essentially said that the United States government was treating people like slaves by drafting them in, into the war. The early test that the United States Supreme Court developed to divide the lines between protected speech under the First Amendment and speech that was considered too harmful was something known as the bad tendency test, which essentially uh, is a very non-speech protective test, right? If the speech has any sort of natural and probable tendency to cause harm, then it can be prohibited. Well, the Schenck case goes up to the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court unanimously affirms the conviction of Schenck and Bear. And one of the points that Justice Holmes made, he said essentially that free speech rights are circumscribed in times of war. That particular phrase, now some may call it dicta, but that particular phrase has technically never been overruled. It's been criticized by many. What Oliver Wendell Holmes also did was he introduced into our lexical in our constitutional lexicology the clear and present danger test. Although, frankly, when we look at it, uh, Jeffrey Stone, the legendary University of Chicago professor, uh, his book *Perilous Times: Free Speech and Wartime* may be the most single comprehensive source on this reality of governmental overreaction in times of emergency and war. And what he said is that in the spring of 1919, when the US Supreme Court decided the Schenck case, decided the Debs case, and decided the Jacob Frowert case, that Holmes initially didn't mean anything different than the bad tendency test. He just used a more colorful phrase. Something happened in the summer of 1919 
what happened is Harvard law professor Zechariah Chaffee, Harold Lasky, and Judge Learned Hand all had discussions with Oliver Wendell Holmes, and they essentially criticized his crabbed interpretation of the First Amendment in the Schenck case. And that ultimately led to Holmes's famous dissent in Abrams versus United States in the fall of 1919. It's that dissent that author Thomas Healy refers to as the great dissent. That's where he breathed the concept of imminency into the clear and present danger test. It's where the First Amendment was really born. It's when Justice Holmes writes that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted into the competition of the market. Incidentally, the other phrase from the Schenck case that Oliver Wendell Holmes said, he said, the most stringent protection for free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. And it's that shouting fire analogy that creates the so-called categorical model of First Amendment jurisprudence in the sense that there are certain types of speech that are not protected. Right, we know what some of these are now. I mean, we've had a little bit of a controversy over incitement to imminent lawless action. What if somebody speaks and they say things that may incite others to do things, right? That's a, that in essence uh, the, is the culmination of Holmes's dissent in Abrams. Hey, David, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt again. Um, I, I'm still seeing just one, the same slide as before. It, um, could you try advancing to your current slide? Okay. Maybe just by clicking on um, it. It should say McCarthyism. It doesn't know. I'm still seeing in times of war and emergency, what happens to individual freedoms? Hmm. I, you know, maybe you could click on the slideshow and I'm not really sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going okay. on. It's not working. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we are following you with rapt attention, so feel free to just continue and yeah. let, like you said, um, we'll send around the, the slideshow a bit later and people can yeah, so, browse it at their, at their will. Yeah, my, my apologies. I don't, I don't know what's no going problem. on with our technology. I may be like Jennifer <laughs> losing the, the battle here. Right. It um, you know, real quickly, the, the, red, the red scare period, uh, Joseph McCarthy, I don't need to spend too much time on this, but uh, the concept of guilt by association became very common here. Um, and again, it continues the pattern. So turning to what the primary subject tonight is, we all remember 9-11. It seared the collective conscience of the nation. Um, I can remember personally, I was to fly out on 10.30 a.m., on September 11, 2001, I was scheduled to fly to New York City to celebrate uh, my recent wedding. I've gotten married September 5, 2001. I'll never forget waking up and my wife was absolutely hysterical. As indicated earlier, it only took 45 days for the United States Congress to pass the Patriot Act, the USA Patriot Act. The first thing that stands out to me about the Patriot Act uh, is the appropriate and strategy behind naming it. It was referred to as the United and Strengthening in America by providing the to appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. Who could disagree with a law that was that aptly named? Well, there were very few. Uh, in the House, it was 357 to 66. I believe 62 of those were Democrats and there were only four Republicans who voted against the Patriot Act in the House. One of those incidentally was Ron Paul of Texas. In the Senate, the vote was 98 to one. Only Wisconsin Senator Russ Feingold was the only individual who voted against it. Feingold essentially said that, look, we have to protect both people and their freedoms. And the USA Patriot Act simply does not strike the right balance between law enforcement and civil liberties. 
Now, in looking at the USA Patriot Act, another thing to, to appreciate about it is that it was a behemoth piece of legislation. It was 342 pages long, and it amended, I believe, 17 different federal laws. So one thing to appreciate about it is that some, a lot of the language of the Patriot Act would add a paragraph or a phrase to existing sections in Title 18 of the United States Code. Um, other sections would add to various other parts of the United States Code. So it takes a while to unpack it. And the reality is that most of the objections to the Patriot Act in my opinion, are actually more based on the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, right? We got roving wiretaps, we got sneak and peek warrants, we got mass governmental surveillance. That raises serious Fourth Amendment uh, issues in society. However, there were certain provisions of the Patriot Act that certainly presented serious First Amendment problems as well. And probably one of the most celebrated or I guess non-celebrated provisions of the Patriot Act was so-called Section 215. And if you Google Section 215, um, you'll see an inundation of information. I mean, it, it literally is one of the most controversial parts of the Patriot Act. And that's because it essentially expanded the FBI's ability to look at almost any tangible thing, as long as the FBI claimed that it was related uh, to an investigation, a terrorist investigation. Previously, the FBI could only obtain business records from things like vehicle rental agencies, storage facilities, and similar places. But what Section 215 did is it allowed the government to obtain business records, library records, healthcare records, logs of ISP providers, and a panoply of other documents and papers. It, it really was uh, something that was considered to be a direct frontal assault on the First Amendment. And another part of Section 215, and this is one that I would, I would show to students, is that Section, 15, Section 215 had built into it what's called a gag order. And I'm sorry you can't see this, but I can read it to you. It's a gag order. It says, quote, no person shall disclose to any other person other than those persons necessary to produce the tangible things under this section that the FBI has sought or obtained tangible things under this section. Now, that's not written very well. After all, it's a statute. Legislators are not known for um, adhering to the plain English movement sometimes. But the reality is what it meant is that if a library got a national security letter, they got a request from uh, the FBI, they could never notify the patrons that the government has requested that information. In other words, it was secrecy. It was a secret investigation and nobody knew about it. And furthermore, there wasn't really a good way to challenge it. Now the ACLU did challenge it um, but the case never reached the United States Supreme Court. Many of the provisions in the Patriot Act, like the Sedition Act of 1798, had so-called sunset provisions. And a sunset provision essentially means that the law is only in, in effect for a three-year period or a five-year period, and then it has to be reauthorized by Congress. And so one of the things that I would teach students is that depending on your point of view, this whole process of reauthorizing or not reauthorizing specific provisions of the Patriot Act shows how the legislative process can work. Because for example, what happened is that Congress passed some amendments to the Patriot Act in March of 2006 
that substantially amended Section 215. So that if you look at current law under 50 USC 1861, um, it requires the FBI to show that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the things are relevant to an authorized investigation. In other words, there was a, um, a pattern of Congress debating whether to keep these provisions and ultimately what happened most of the time is Congress would reauthorize the provisions, but they would be amended and they would be less offensive to constitutional freedoms. Now, if you ask the ACLU or the Electronic Frontier Foundation or the American Library Association, they, may, they still may have some serious constitutional problems with certain of these provisions, but they certainly weren't as noxious as they were when they were passed uh, in October uh, 26, 2001. Finally, and I have a link to this in the presentation, finally, Section 215, it was reauthorized in 2006, it was reauthorized in 2011, it was reauthorized in 2015. Finally, March 15th, 2020, um, it expired. Um, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation has uh, excellent uh, resources on this. I particularly like the piece by India McKinney, this titled Section 215 Expired Year in Review 2020. So I think it's important if you take 215, because I think it's a really good provision to debate with your students, I would put on my screen the original language of Section 215, then the language from 2006, what happened in 2011, 2015, and then it finally expiring at the end of 2019. That, in essence, is, shows that our system can work that members of Congress can debate these things reasonably and come to uh, different conclusions. Now, the other provision of the Patriot Act and really the only provision of the Patriot Act that squarely reached before the United States Supreme Court was section 805, at least the only provision related to the First Amendment that reached the US Supreme Court, that was section 805. Um, and to understand Section 805, we have to go back to the 1996 federal law, the Anti-Terrorism and Death Penalty Act of 1996, something that was signed into law by President Clinton. That's a very controversial law that came up, parts of that came up um, for uh, candidate Hillary Clinton in, in 2016 uh, that were actually somewhat negative. Uh, to, to, to her campaign. But in that law, it, it said no material support or resources to terrorist organizations. Well, in the Patriot Act, they amended that law to prohibit so-called expert assistance or advice to this material support definition. Now, why would that create a First Amendment problem? Well, according to the Humanitarian Law Project, it presented and restricted core First Amendment speech because the Humanitarian Law Project wanted to provide aid to the Kurdistan Workers' Party and a group called the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ilam. I may be mispronouncing that. Both of these groups were designated as foreign terrorist organizations by the United States Secretary of State. But the Humanitarian Law Project wanted to help them, for example, make petitions to the United Nations, uh, learn more about how to act consonantly with international law. They were not sending money to fund terrorist activities. They were trying to help different groups conduct uh, and act in a lawful manner, not an unlawful manner. Um, and ultimately, the Humanitarian Law Project challenges Section 805 as amended by the Patriot Act in a case that ultimately reached the United States Supreme Court 
Um, and the, the arguments were this, that the ban on, quote, expert advice and assistance was unconstitutionally vague in violation of the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Remember, because they're challenging a federal law, it's brought under the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment, not the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. I always try to make that clear with my students, that when you make a due process claim against the federal law, it's the Fifth Amendment. When you make a due process claim against the states or a local governmental law, it's the 14th Amendment. Um, and a federal district court judge, I believe it was Judge Aubrey Collins, actually ruled in 2004, I believe it was, that this law was unconstitutionally vague. Now, why do we care about vagueness when it comes to First Amendment? Because we have an extra concern about vague laws because they chill First Amendment freedoms. But it's important to understand that the Humanitarian Law Project did not just file a vagueness due process argument, they filed direct First Amendment free speech and First Amendment freedom of association arguments. The case goes up to the United States Supreme Court. It was argued before the court in 2009. And on June 21st, 2010, we got the court's decision in Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. At that time, uh, Eric Holder was the sitting US Attorney General, so that's why uh, he was the named party. And the court ruled six to three that this particular law was constitutionally applied uh, to the Humanitarian Law Project and the individual plaintiffs. The majority opinion was written by Chief Justice John G. Roberts Jr., our 17th Chief Justice in American history, a former law clerk to Justice Rehnquist, a former clerk to Rehnquist, who was our 16th Chief Justice in American history. Now, what Robert said, and, and to understand this case, and the analogy I make on this is each side made polar opposite arguments that were, uh, that, th that the Supreme Court rejected. So the Humanitarian Law Project said that this law directly violates the First Amendment because you are prohibiting us from engaging in, in core political speech. For example, teaching the Kurdistan Workers Party how to petition the United Nations is a form of pure political speech. That was our argument. Um, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts rejected that argument in his opinion. He said, we're not talking about pure political speech. We're talking about speech that at least is somewhat related uh, and can be used. And if we, if we help these groups, that some of these groups may subvert some of that help and then use that help to further their terrorist arm. In other words, it's not always that easy to separate the so-called non-terrorist activities of these groups from the terrorist activities of these groups. Um, the government had an equally uh, far out argument, I think. The United States government argued that this provision was constitutional and did not violate the First Amendment because it only limited conduct, not speech. It's what we in the First Amendment community refer to as the speech dichotomy argument. And it's one that I really do take a lot of time when I speak to high school students because it's one of the most common problems when we examine First Amendment cases. For example, when Gregory Lee Johnson burned the American flag as a form of political protest, was his act of burning the flag unprotected conduct or was it a form of noxious political speech? When Paul Robert Cohen wore his infamous F the draft jacket to a Los Angeles County courthouse, was that what Justice John Marshall Harlan said was a form of speech i.e. one man's vulgarity is another's lyric? Or was it what Justice Harry Blackman said in dissent that was an immature antic that was mainly conduct and little speech? In other words, the speech conduct dichotomy permeates a lot of modern First Amendment law. 
But to his credit, Chief Justice Roberts rejected that argument, said, look, the First Amendment issue before us is far more refined than either the plaintiffs or the government would have it. It's not whether the government may prohibit pure political speech or may prohibit material support in the form of conduct. The issue, according to Chief Justice Roberts, is whether the government may prohibit what plaintiffs want to do, provide material support to these two groups in the form of speech. And ultimately what Chief Justice Roberts said is that you can't really separate. And while we evaluate this law under strict scrutiny, the government has a compelling interest in combating terrorism and it's one of the rare instances in which the court applies strict scrutiny and upholds the law. Strict scrutiny is the term that we use as the highest form of judicial review. In the words of former US Supreme Court Justice David Souter quote, strict scrutiny leaves few survivors. Well, the material support provision as amended by the Patriot Act, that's one of the few survivors, the law, the law was upheld. Um, Robert said, we simply hold that in prohibiting the particular forms of support that plaintiffs seek to provide to these foreign terrorist groups, the law does not violate the freedom of speech. There is a First Amendment nugget, however, in Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, and I always emphasize this when I talk about the Humanitarian Law Project case. He said, quote, our, pres our precedents old and new make clear that concerns of national security and foreign relations do not warrant abdication of the judicial role. We do not defer to the government's reading of the First Amendment, even when such interests are at stake. That language has been quoted a lot in subsequent briefs in a variety of situations. Now the ruling was 6-3 in Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. Three of our justices dissented, Justice Breyer, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And according to Justice Breyer, the government simply has not met its burden that the interpretation of the statute uh, serves the government's compelling interest in combating terrorism. According to Breyer, Ginsburg, and Sotomayor, in other words, the government, uh, the government yes, had a compelling interest in combating terrorism, but they could have done this in other ways without prohibiting this type of expert advice or assistance, which really wasn't directly, uh, there was no showing that that directly helped uh, anyone with a, a terrorist aim. Breyer writes, quote, in my view, the government has not made the strong showing necessary to justify under the First Amendment, the criminal prosecution of those who engage in such activities. All of the activities that the Humanitarian Law Project was trying to do involved the advocacy of political ideas and the lawful means of achieving political ends, right? Not the unlawful acts of terrorism. Now there's two other aspects that I wanna talk about uh, about the Patriot Act. And the first one is the concept of governmental surveillance. And while it's true that we generally litigate wiretap cases and things of that nature under the, under the Fourth Amendment, it's also true that mass governmental surveillance impacts our First Amendment freedoms. And I would submit to you that it impacts them in profound ways. And it refers to what we refer to in the First Amendment world as the chilling effect. And I'll quote you from an article that I, that I had published uh, about mass governmental surveillance. It's titled, Government Surveillance Threatens First Amendment Freedoms. And I wrote, quote, we tend to think of such surveillance under the rubric of the Fourth Amendment, which prohibits the government from engaging in unreasonable searches and seizures. But surveillance also negatively impacts freedom of speech, assembly, association, and even thought. And at the end of the day, it's freedom of thought that we must absolutely protect. Because why is the First Amendment the most important part of the Bill of Rights, arguably? Why did Justice Benjamin Cardozo refer to it as our matrix, our indispensable provision that 
provides protection for every other individual, individual freedom. It's because it protects freedom of thought. It's because freedom of speech is inextricably intertwined with thought. As Justice Thurgood Marshall once wrote in 1969, our entire constitutional heritage rebels at giving government the power to control men's minds and thoughts. The last thing, and I think it, while it, it's not directly a First Amendment issue, I think we have to talk about it, is that one of the unfortunate aftermaths of 9-11 and what happened in the country uh, was profiling. Some have referred to it as ushering in an age of Islamophobia. And if you talk to many people, um, to give you one example, my close friend, Bippel Chug, my college roommate, that's my 9-11 story. He was scheduled to go at the, twin, the, the, uh, next to high, the next to highest floor of the Twin Towers. He was scheduled to go at 8 a.m. on September 11, 2001. Um, he gets a call the night before, we've rescheduled, can you come in at 11 a.m.? Otherwise, he would have been there. I believe he went to 57 funerals of friends of him who perished. But the other thing that happened to my friend Bipal Chug, who is actually of Indian descent, is that every time he went around New York City, he got stopped. He got profiled. And that is an unfortunate reality of what happened uh, in, uh, in the aftermath is that many people were profiled. Now, on the other hand, when talking about the Patriot Act, there are some supporters. And there are many who have said that some of the provisions in the Patriot Act were very helpful in fighting terrorism. They said they alleged that it broke down the walls of communication and allowed greater information sharing between the FBI and the CIA. They say that it gave the government needed uh, extra powers to conduct more surveillance. And there are those who allege that the Patriot Act helped uh, break up at least 50 different plots to, um, uh, to, to by terrorists to do bomb and, and engage in other terrorist activities. I don't know enough to know whether that's true. You know, Mark read that prophetic quote about how to calibrate the balance between liberty and security. I think that's just something that we're constantly going to have to struggle with. What I can say is that 9-11 certainly did sear the collective conscience of our nation and I hope that we all remember it uh, 20 years later. I, I hope to one day uh, attend Jennifer's museum because I'd, I'd very much like to see it. Um, I hope this was helpful. I apologize that you can't see my slides, but I'll share them with everybody listening or anybody that wants them. Thank Thanks. you so much, David. Uh, we do have some questions here uh, from the audience. And uh, let me start with Donald Rogers. He says, nice talk. Professor Hudson noted how Federalists implemented the 1798 Sedition Act for partisan purposes. Did sections 215 and 805 become similarly politicized in their implementation? That is used against political opponents or groups disfavored by the party in power. I'd be surprised if that were the case, but. <laughs> Yeah, and I wonder if that's the Donald Rogers who uh, I had the great privilege of judging we the people with. I would bet if, if I had a dollar, I would say yes. If so, um, I highly recommend his uh, recent book. I believe it's on the CIA versus Hague case. Brilliant man, a brilliant scholar. Um, I don't think it was used politically in the same way as... Um, the Sedition Act of 1798. At least I haven't seen the evidence of that. Now, there was the prosecution of the uh, Idaho um, graduate student. I believe it was back in um, 2004, and a jury actually acquitted him. Um, and some may say that there were certain political opponents prosecuted, but I don't think it was as stark and as, um, uh, what's the word? It, it wasn't as... Um, 
obvious, I guess, is what happened, I think, in the Sedition Act of, of 1798. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let me ask another question from, from our audience. Uh, now, this is a big question. Um, should, and this comes from Greg Primo, should we teach 9-11 as a date or as an era or both? And I guess, you know, the way I look at that is, is, is do we teach it as a, you know, a thing that happened, a discrete thing that happened on one day? Or is this really, you know, does this really inaugurate a, a 20 year or more era where, you know, the, the Patriot Act was um, signed and, you know, the government had expanded powers? What do you think, David? Uh, I, I would teach it more as an era. I mean, I, th I think that it, it, it certainly 9-11 itself was important, but, you know, I think, you know, you may, depending on what perspective you look at, you may go back to the 1993 bombing in New York City. Um, and mm -hmm. I certainly would not just stop at 9-11 and, and the Patriot Act. I think you've got to look at, and what that's what I tried to convey in, in my talk, is that there were vigorous debates in this country as to whether particular provisions of the Patriot Act should be reauthorized. And then they were amended. And there were some positive amendments to the to the to the to these Patriot Act provisions. And I think that shows that the legislative process can work. I know it's deeply political, politically polarized, but some of the amendments that were incorporated, I think, made the law better. All right. Um, now, one final question. Uh, let's see. What an attendee says, an, an anonymous attendee says, uh, makes a point that one, one of our new terrorist threats, I guess uh, you, could, you could frame it that way, is homegrown white nationalist extremists. Um, and, and the attendee asks, what should the what can and should the government do to control organizing on social media apps? Does, does the government have any powers under the Patriot Act or or any other um, you know? Well, they certainly you know if we go back to the um, I mean the, the Oklahoma City bombing was it uh, Timothy McVeigh and uh, Terry Nichols in that horrific tragedy? Mm -hmm. It certainly is the case that there's there's homegrown terrorism as well i recommend looking at the southern poverty law center's uh, report on on hate groups and there's a disturbing rise in hate groups and, and certainly they're being monitored uh how much the government should um you know there, there's there's always the big debate about do we squelch people from speaking on the internet do we shut people down when they hate speech or uh, by doing that, do we drive them underground and make them come back with a virulent, even more aggressive action? Um, you know, I, you know, this may sound a little quixotic, but I think the preferred First Amendment remedy is what Justice Brandeis said way back in Whitney v. California, right? If there be time to expose the discussion, the falsehood and fallacies to avert the evils by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. And one of the things that Brandeis also said is he also gave us the justification for the safety valve theory of free speech, right? That if we don't allow the speech, we don't know that we don't know it's there. And so if, if people go completely underground, then we don't know what they're up to. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather know my enemy then have somebody just suddenly right there. Yeah. Excellent point. Um, all right, I'm, I'm gonna ask one more. I know I said that would be the last, but I can't resist. Uh, this this act, question actually reminds me of uh, what was happening in World War I, you alerted, alluded to earlier. Uh, Adam asks, what would you say to someone who says, limiting some speech during tragedy slash war is necessary to achieve victory? I think that's exactly what Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes was saying in uh, Schenck versus United States, right? When his opinion, he said, when a nation's at war, 
there has to be some necessary limiting or circumscribing speech. But I don't think we should squelch or ban um, speech that's critical of what the government's doing because that runs counter to the spirit of the First Amendment, right? That we needed those voices that were against the Sedition Act of 1798. We, we need uh, dissenting voices, right? We, there's never going to be total unanimity. It is true that in 9-11, I never seen the country come together. Um, there, there, was a, there was a coming together there for, for, a, for a brief period of time. I remember attending a George Carlin concert uh, right after 9-11, about, I think it was October, November of 2001. I remember he sort of, he sort of made the snide remark, I'm temporarily lending my support to Governor Bush. Uh, but the point was taken, right? He was basically saying, look, there are people that are trying to blow us up. So, you know, let's, uh, let's try to, uh, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to give some support to our government. All right, and with that, David Hudson, thank you so much. Um, I, the, you know, a bunch of questions keep appearing. We'll see if we have time to get to them at the very end of this, but I do wanna hand it over now uh, to Maria Gallo uh, so that Maria can um, explain our new lesson plan called 9-11 and Civil Liberties. Uh, so Maria, if you are out there, as soon as you're ready, go ahead and take the, uh, take, Take control. Thank you, Mark. Um, can you hear me, first of all? Yes, we can okay. hear you perfectly well. Thank you. And I think I'm going to share this, but I'm not 100% sure. We're going you to try are. to get this to work properly. Yes, and so far, so good. I'm seeing your Yeah, but show. it's not going to uh, the slideshow as I would. Oh, here we go. There we go. Excellent. I was Perfect. not quite sure if that would work or not, but um, the Center for Civic Education, please, 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 please go to our website. We have loads of free materials on there, but um, we also happen to have, and I put down Mia's name, Mia Nagawecki, who is our vice president and chief of staff, as long as, as well as mine, because I think at any point Mia should feel free to jump in whenever she wants to. And so I put down both of our names. Um, if you go to our website and you happen to click on teaching resources, you will see on the right-hand side, uh, Constitution Day and Citizenship Day. You'll also see 9-11 and the US Constitution. All of these are lesson plans that are free. And if you click on Constitution Day, you will see that uh, the grade levels appear as well as the various lesson plans. We have them from K through 12. And um, you will find our 9-11 and our civil liberties uh, lesson there uh, very soon if, it, if it's not already up there. Um, I realize that it says 9-11 and civil liberties because I think that's very important, but I please remember that we are honoring, this lesson could be used at any time, but we are honoring the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And as a former New Yorker, I can tell you that nothing, nothing in this world has ever affected me as much as 9-11 has. Um, this lesson explores the challenges the United States faced as a result of the terrorist attacks. And not just in New York, because I know we have this tendency to put up the Twin Towers because that's where most of the tragedy took place. But please remember that it, it was also in the Pentagon. It was also in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. So uh, when, when the plane went down uh, or when the passengers took the plane down. So please remember that as well. And I think that we need to share all of that. Uh, yes, it's great that the Twin Towers are uh, are elements of this, but uh, or symbolic of this, but they are certainly not the only ones that ever got affected by this. And I think that's something we need to remember. Um, we have our objectives here, as well as the materials needed, like just like everything else the Center for Civic Education does. Um, you don't have to go looking for a lot of these things. 
uh, President, the President George W. Bush's address to the nation on September 11th, uh, 2001. It is actually a is, is actually hyperlinked, so you'll be able to get to it. The Bill of Rights is also hyperlinked, but of course, the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution, can be found on the back of any textbook, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. And uh, we have excerpt or summaries for you uh, on the Patriot Act from the Department of Justice and. It, they are provided for you at the end of the lesson. So you don't have to worry about, oh my God, how am I going to get all this stuff? It, no, you don't have to worry about that. We're going to ask you to have your students watch. You can either do this in class or you can have them watch on their own. Um, but we would like you to uh, create small groups, and, and I say that being very careful, uh, recognizing the fact that we have everything from two kids at home to 45 kids in a classroom at any given time. So we do would like you to break them up into small groups at some point. And, and while they're watching President Bush, we want them to focus on these questions. Who attacked who and what was attacked on 9-11? I think that that's very important, not just the physicality of it, but the ideology of it. What was being attacked? According to President Bush, what did he, what was actually attacked? And how, and how, and what promises did George Bush actually make or President Bush actually make? Um, based on the president's words, his tone, his action, I think students need to forget. A lot of times they just concentrate on the words. I think you need to have the kids concentrate on tones and actions. What do you think Americans were feeling that day? And I think you can from, from, watching, from watching President Bush too talk about this uh, to the nation that night, I can get a feeling of how people felt. And um, I think it's important for them to talk about this. Um, after watching the speech, we'd like for them to talk out loud and discuss the, fo the focus questions that, that were there. Um, we don't necessarily want you to take a lot of time doing that, but it's, again, it's all up to you as the teacher in the classroom. Please remember that everything that we suggest are just that, they are suggestions. No one knows your class better than you. And certainly um, you would be the one to make the decisions as to the size, as to the length. For example, I know that this program or this lesson can be done in one day with a homework assignment. Um, but if you decide that you wanna do this in two or three days, that's totally up to you. Um, I don't know that you have that kind of time, God bless you if you do, but um, we try to get things done in short amounts of time. For example, um, if you were to take just a one sentence excerpt, for a one sentence excerpt from pres the president's speech, such as America was targeted for attack because they are the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, have them have your students in those same small groups that you decided upon um, just to talk about what those freedoms might be and give them two or three minutes. And, and I honestly don't think you need to do that more than that to generate some of their ideas. And, and you can have them write their ideas down in their small groups on chart paper that you put around the room, et cetera. One thing is for sure, you want to get some feedback from the students. Um, you want to introduce the concept of civil liberties. Where are they? Where can they be found? Um, working either in those same small groups or in different groups, you, you should have the students talk about uh, what the, what, where they can find it. Now, certainly the U.S. Constitution, the preamble uh, of the Constitution, the, 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 the Ten Amendments will give you uh, what you need as far as those are concerned as far as those civil liberties are, are. Uh, but I think there's nothing better than having kids rewrite in their own words uh, what they think the First through Fifth Amendment actually says. And you can, and I would ask you to please do that um, 
either they can do that in class, they can do that as a group, they can do that as a classroom, um, but the, we want the students to rewrite or they can do it individually and then share. And then we'd like them to share the ideas. What civil liberties are encompassed, are encompassed in these amendments? Um, how do these amendments seek to protect people from the government? How can the government protect people? And I think that's very important because I think that very often 9-11 is seen as a failure of government a failure because we all got complacent uh, about the ability to be able to have government protect us. And so where does that government responsibility lie? And more importantly, where does our own responsibility lie? Um, and then of course, connect all of these ideas to President Bush's speech. Um, I, I, and we're going to ask that question again a little bit later. So you may want to do that. Um, in the conclusion, we ask uh, that students express uh, their ideas uh, in a letter to the editor or of a local newspaper or, or as regular essay, or you can have them express it individually or as a group, however you see fit. But we thought that we wanted to, to be uh, a homework assignment and a performance task. And so therefore uh, we, were, we wanted them to talk about uh, their opinion of the Patriot Act and how, balance, and how it balanced liberty and safety in 2001. And I think it's important because the way in which safety and liberty may have been balanced then is not the same as we would do it today. So we're asking kids to transport themselves who were not around in 2001. Remember that many of our students, or actually all of our students today, were not around when, when, uh, when this happened. Um, to the extent to which the Patriot Act specific, specifically and the liberty and the safety debate generally are relevant today. So how is it relevant to us today? Um, is there any relevance to what we are doing today? And I think there is. Um, what do they see as a need for more freedom or more protections in the United States? And where do they see this very specifically? And how could people work together in concert so that we have a healthy constitutional democracy? Remembering everything Professor Hudson said in talking about um, making sure that we um, express our ideas and yet at the same time do not cause a problem to the U.S. government, especially when we are in war. But we do need to hear these ideas and I think it is very, very important. So that's us in a nutshell. Um, please, 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 this, this uh, lesson plan was very much a part of what we expected to do. Um, and like I said, earlier, we did not talk about 9-11 as just the 20th anniversary because you could really do this lesson at any individual time. You could do it on Constitution Day, you could do it on the 20th anniversary or which is a Saturday this year, so probably on the Monday, uh, the 13th. Um, you could do it on that day or you could do it next year or whenever you have the ability and the opportunity. So I'm going to stop sharing and Mark, I'm going to get this back to you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Maria, for, for that. I think we do have a few more minutes, just a few. Um, and any of our panelists may chime in if they wish. Mark, if Person, I can yes. chime in for one Please. quick second. Go right ahead. Thank you, Maria. Wonderful job. I just want to mention, um, I think we skipped over a pretty key piece of the lesson, uh, which is have your students analyze and unpack those first five amendments in the Bill of Rights to understand you know, what is a civil liberty? And then, uh, as Maria mentioned, we are providing you with summaries from some of those key uh, aspects of the Patriot Act. And we're asking you to invite your students to read through and analyze those as well, uh, so that they can have the idea of civil liberties and, and the source itself, uh, the Patriot Act together, to then revisit that question of freedom and uh, safety liberty and security um and again connect it back to uh what president bush said on on september 11th about american freedom being a defining aspect of our nation and part of what was under attack 
but that that delicate balance that exists. And I'll also just add that um, you know we've we've mentioned a number of times over the course of this session tonight that it's interesting that uh, students in our classrooms today, of course, were not alive uh, at the time. They have therefore also no living memory of it. Um, but they have come up in a world that is full of crises uh, and therefore and have only ever lived in a world with some version of the Patriot Act enacted. So giving them a space, time and a prompt to reflect upon this question from the context of their own lives and the world in, in which they've always lived and grown up is, I think, a powerful way to not only honor uh, the legacy of 9-11, but help them understand what a turning point means uh, in American society and history and what it is to live through it and how these major constitutional issues are not just these abstract constitutional issues, but are rather things that we grapple with uh, when we're living through these, these challenging moments as, as they are right now themselves with uh, COVID, among other things. So thank you very much, Maria. Uh, and sorry, Mark, thank you, I'll Mia. turn it back to you. That, that's quite all right. Uh, thank you for that. And another question came in about adapting the lesson for younger students or students of all, all ability levels. One thing I suggested was, um, as far as amendments, the, the first through fifth amendments, uh, we do have a great resource on the website. And I put a link there. Oh, actually, that's the wrong link. But I'll put the right link in there. <laughs> um, to uh, the consource. consource US Constitution for Kids. And it breaks down in kid-friendly terms, um, the, uh, well, the, con the whole constitution, but also the amendments. So that might actually really help um, kids to understand, um, you know, uh, the amendments, which, you know, are, are written, may seem like plain English for us, but for kids, uh, definitely not. Uh, you might also just take one aspect of the uh, Patriot Act and ask kids to examine that. Um, all right. Well, uh, another question came in about uh, January 6th, the attacks uh, on the Capitol on January 6th. Um, so is there any more modern application? So the question is, what point is limitation of speech necessary to maintain safety and stability? I mean, I think we've covered that uh, quite a bit in here, um, but are there provisions, I assume that there still are provisions of the Patriot Act, uh, David Hudson, that would apply to something like the January 6th uh, event and have actually been used by law enforcement? Yeah, Mark, I think, you know, a couple of the questions, um, uh, the January 6th question, and then are people still in prison for Patriot Act violations? I think it's important to understand that the bulk of the Patriot Act was not codifying new crimes per se. It was giving the government enhanced powers um, to conduct surveillance and, and things like that. So th there certainly are people who are still in prison um, through investigations and investigators use the enhanced powers under, under the Patriot Act. But the Patriot Act, by and large, at least the bulk of it, was not the codification or creation of new crimes, per se. Um, as far as what happened on January 6th, the question is whether um, essentially that speech was so bad that it rose to the level of incitement to imminent lawless action under Brandenburg versus Ohio. And I think you're absolutely correct that the incitement standard from Brandenburg is really the culmination of what we talked about earlier about Justice Holmes's clear and present danger test. It's a very high standard of meat. Um, and people have disagreed, frankly, on that, on that question. So the, the question is a great one, but I don't know. There, there's one other question here about limiting Supreme Court justices' terms to 16 or 18 years. I do not agree with that. I, I think that we should keep life tenure. I think the founding fathers had that in there for a reason. Um, and I think uh, putting 18-year terms is a bad idea. I, I don't like it. All right. Well, any, uh, well I think that does it. We are right at the, we said we, we'd end at 8.30 and I want to stay to that. 
Um, thank you very much to our scholar, David Hudson uh, of Belmont University. Uh, thank you for Jennifer Legassi of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, Maria Gallo of the Center for Civic Education and Mia Nagawicki of the Center for Civic Education. Thank you all so much. Um, and thanks will... to Mark Gage from the oh, Center for Civic uh, Education, our amazing host. Thank you, I just push buttons, that's all I do. No, um, you do a lot more than that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, um, I'll be sending around a recording of this tomorrow. Uh, and as soon as I can, I'll send the other resources, including David's PowerPoint. And I just wanna thank everyone here. You have, um, I hope you have gained a lot of insight into uh, the Patriot Act and the government's response to 9-11. Um, thanks to David Hudson and our other speakers today. And I hope that you've gained valuable resources that you can take to your classroom uh, to teach 9-11. And with that- I can just chime in, Mark, to say yes. thank you to all the teachers who are on the ground doing the hard work day in and day out, and especially after the last two years and, and in commemoration of this 20th anniversary. So thank you all for your hard work. Thank you for joining us. Until next time. And with that, we will, yeah, until next time. See you, everyone. Thank you so much. And good night. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Good night.